The Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise again tonight to address the Foreign Investment Protection and Promotion Agreement, or FIPA, that this government recently concluded with China but has not yet put into place. I will start by reiterating the New Democrats' commitment to working with Canadian businesses and labour and our international trade partners to expand trade and investment opportunities around the world. The Canadian economy and Canadians' jobs rely on trade and our businesses benefit from foreign investment. Of course, China is a big part of that trading dynamic. They are the second largest economy in the world. They're an ascending economy, and there is a profound connection between our two countries. In my riding of Vancouver Kingsway, nearly half of my constituents are either immigrants from China or have Chinese heritage. And this connection is what brings both cultural and economic vibrancy to my community and to our country. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, this FIPA took 18 years to negotiate between Canada and China. It has provisions that, uh, once in force, will keep it in force for at least 31 years. Yet, this government and the MPs on the government side of the House did not schedule any form of debate or study about this FIPA. The minister would not come before our committee to answer any questions about the FIPA. In fact, the government members would not allow any study of the FIPA at committee, a motion I put forward to study a committee, was turned down. And they did not schedule the FIPA to be brought to a vote in this House. Now, Mr. Speaker, if anything deserves careful study and scrutiny, it is this investment protection agreement. Now, the general concept is sound. The protection of investors is especially needed in China. It is not disrespectful to China to point out the difficulties and challenges that investors, Canadian investors, in fact, any kind of foreign investors face in China. There's inconsistent application of the rule of law, there's difficulty enforcing contracts, and those are well-known issues. So the concept of a FIPA is sound between the two countries. But FIPAs like the one we are discussing now can prevent governments from enacting policies in the public interest. What we're talking about are provisions of this particular FIPA that are of concern to Canadians. This agreement that the Conservatives signed would allow foreign state-owned companies to buy up more and more interest in our natural resources, and if a government tried to impose restrictions on them, we, our Canadian taxpayers, can be sued. For the first time in Canadian history, Mr. Speaker, this Conservative government allowed for a dispute resolution process, a process that is already prone to corporate bias and antithetical to principles of the rule of law, They've allowed this process to happen behind closed doors. That's right. The government signed a section that says if one of the countries that's being sued wants to, they can have the hearing, the legal suit challenging the uh, breach of the agreement to be heard behind closed doors and all documents would, not be, would be hidden from the public. Now, Mr. Speaker, Canada is a democratic country where we follow the norms of the rule of law. The rule of law is we have open courts. We have an open justice system. We don't allow court tribunal systems to be heard in private, maybe in a private commercial setting, but not when taxpayers' dollars are on the hook, and this government signed a provision like that for the first time in history. Second, this FIPA contains a provision that allows China and Canada to keep all non-conforming measures, which are measures that are currently restraints on trade. The problem is that China has been a closed economy for a long time and has many, many non-conforming measures whereas Canada is a liberal, uh, has followed a liberal market model. So my question to the government is this. Why would they sign an imbalanced agreement that treats Canadian investors unfairly, gives them less rights than Chinese investors in Canada, and has a dispute resolution mechanism that allows disputes to be heard behind closed doors in secret? Why is that, Mr. Speaker? Well, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the part of uh, the speech that the member from Vancouver Kingsway got correct, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that China is the second largest economy in the world. Uh, it'll be the largest economy in the world more than likely by 2030. The uh, most egregious part that he has incorrect of, of many is the fact that this signs can up for 31 years. It's renewable up to a period of 31 years. Doesn't sign anyone up for a 31-year period. The, uh, the other issue that 
that quite frankly is incorrect is the idea that it prevents Canada from enacting legislation on, or public policy to benefit Canadians. That's absolutely incorrect. Mr. Speaker, here, here's, the, here's the issue, and, and I'm going to try to sum it up. I know we have limited time, but it's an important issue, and I, I want to take some, some time to, to, to discuss it. The, uh, and, and one more point before I start in, in my speech, of course, is the fact that prior to our government coming to power in 2006, treaties weren't tabled in the House of Commons for 31 days, and there was no opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to discuss those treaties. So, you know, somehow we're getting a lot of, a, a lot of rhetoric about the government not discussing this treaty. We tabled the treaty in the House of Commons for 31 days. There were 30, 31 sitting days, Mr. Speaker. So it was 31 sitting days, 31 opportunities, numerous opportunities for any of the opposition to discuss this treaty if they wish to. The reality is they really don't want the bright light of the sun to shine on this treaty because it will refute the accusations they're making against it. The, you know, listen, trade's part of, a, a part of the powerful engine that, that, that drives the Canadian economy. We've moved forward with a very ambitious pro-trade plan, uh, opening new markets for Canadian exporters, including Mr. Speaker, in the very fast-growing Asia-Pacific uh, region. We've moved aggressively, uh, expanding commercial relations in the regions to create jobs and economic benefits. And those economic benefits and opportunities are tremendous. Asia-Pacific countries represent huge markets with economic growth rates two to three times the global average. So we're creating the right conditions here at home for Canadian businesses and exporters to compete and succeed internationally. An important part of that equation, Mr. Speaker, is ensuring that two-way trade and investment between Canada and other countries, including China, take place in a stable and secure manner. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we signed over 24 foreign investment promotion and protection agreements with key trade and investment partners, including China, the world's second largest economy, as we mentioned earlier. And, you know, let's, let's be clear. What happens if we don't sign these agreements? Then we are, we are working in a system without clear rules, without parameters, and without clear guidelines. It's important to note, Mr. Speaker, that as a result of this agreement, Canadian investors in China will no longer have to rely on the Chinese legal system to have investment disputes resolved. And let me be clear, this agreement will give Canadian investors in China the same types of protections that foreign investors have long had in Canada. So I have to ask the member opposite, why would he deny Canadian investors the same benefits abroad that foreign investors have in Canada? The Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, here are some facts. This agreement is in force for 15 years, and even if this government does not renew the agreement uh, and cancels it, it, the provisions of this agreement mean that it will stay in force for a further 15 years after that, and that member well knows that. So this agreement, even if you cancel it, is in force for a minimum of 30 years plus the one year, and that's a fact. Second of all, um, uh, you know, I put a motion before the Trade Committee to study FIPA. Now, uh, like this Conservative government is fond of doing, they went behind closed doors and in secret. So I'm not at liberty to tell you uh, how anybody voted. But what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, is when we came out of that meeting, my motion was denied. So when this government tries to tell the Canadian public that they want to shine the light on this agreement, that is belied by the facts. They refused to study this FIFA and bring stakeholders, Canadians and investors to our committee where we could actually study this agreement to see if it's a good deal. And the reason the Conservatives were afraid to do that is because they know it's a bad deal because they know Canadians would not accept a deal that allows China to go behind closed doors to hear disputes in private. And they wouldn't sign a deal that gives Canadian investors less equal treatment than Chinese investors. So my question to this, this member is, why won't the government agree to study this deal it, when it has such important ramifications, will be in force for a minimum 31 years, why won't they allow the Trade Committee to study this? Answer that direct question for Canadians. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Again, Mr. Speaker, the, the honourable member wants to, to, to lead off in a, in a misleading way on, on 31 years. So I'm going to come back to my original statement about the 31 days, 31 sitting days, that this agreement was tabled in the House and why the NDP and the Liberals shied away from debate. They had ample opportunity to debate this. They wanted to draw this out and make something more of it than it actually was, and that ruse simply did not work. So as I've said before, Mr. Speaker, our government has signed this agreement to help protect the interest of Canadian investors, particularly Canadian investors in China. I would point out that our government has brought transparency to the treaty process by tabling it in the House of Commons. We, uh, it, should, it should be very clear that it was not the Conservative Party that chose not to debate it. It was the Conservative Party that chose to table it. It was the NDP Party that chose not to debate it here in the House of Commons for the country to hear. And this is very similar to the other 24 uh, investment treaties we signed with key trade and investment partners. It establishes clear rules for Canadian businesses when they're investing abroad, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh,